So what I'm doing here in Doha is representing the Centre for Low Carbon Futures, which is a relatively tiny NGO back in the UK, mm -hmm. and I'm talking about some work we've done recently on food security in particular, mm -hmm. looking at the recent time horizon of the 2020s, but I work more generally on climate change. Mm -hmm. Really, I've been working on climate change for quite some time now, and it's really good fun. Yeah, well, <laughs> I think you're probably one of the first people I've met who said it's really good fun. In in terms of food security, it seems to have become an increasingly um, sort of uh, talked about topic over the past couple of years. The FAO are releasing um, report after report, and there are concerns that we're not going to be able to. Feed, feed everyone on the planet, and obviously the population's rising too. Is it is it quite the sort of catastrophe that um, that, that that some might might lead us to expect? Uh, I sort of think if you look at the bigger picture of food security, it's really more kind of complicated mm -hmm. than that. There are lots of things going on, in fact, together. It's certainly being affected by climate change tremendously, and the stuff I'll be talking about does really reaffirm that and assure us of that. But um, the, when you look at the demographics of what's going on in the world, um, countries like the Chinese, for example, there's a lot of food crops, but most of that goes towards feeding pigs and things. Mm. So it depends what diets people are eating and the way that changes. And the big thing is the way the food is distributed around the different countries mm. and the import and export becomes a big problem too and when people dig up food crops to grow crops for ex export like mm -hmm. coffee is a big example of that and, yeah. and also another controversial thing has been growing biofuels of course but mm. that is fortunately now I think on the decline and yeah. I think people have finally realised that you don't dig up a perfectly good crop to grow fuel. Well, yeah, biofuels has been in, in the news recently. Is, it, is, um, is, there a, is there a sort of increasing concern that because, um, you know, as the world is developing and as people become more wealthy, they will go towards that sort of higher protein diet and, you know, will have more cattle and as a result that will create more issues further down the line? Um, yeah, well, you're... I've had an expertise here, but it's great to speculate. And um, yeah, I sort of think in fact, that is the big pr 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 pressure in fact on our kind of food security when countries like India and China in particular, they're on this very high development curve and they're beginning to eat very different food products. And um, in fact, our work does show in fact the, the two of the worst hit countries by climate change probably will be China and India in fact and a country like India perhaps doesn't have so much ability to adapt to the threat of mm -hmm. climate change compared to a country like China yeah. which we think has a slightly bigger adaptive capacity. And in terms of the work you're doing, and you told me you're going to be taking part in a presentation as well, how, how do you see that feeding into the negotiations that, that are happening here? Well, oh well, I think it's to concentrate the policy makers that are here today, mm. not on some very far off distant horizon of the <coughs> 2050s or the 2100s. Mm. We're really interested in what's happening in the more immediate future. So we're looking at the threat posed by climate change in the 2020s. So it's far more immediate than we think. And they ought to be going back from this conference, hopefully, and trying to put immediate decisions on the table. And it's about opportunities too for them, I think. Um, and the key focus would be the International Fund for Adaptation, really kind of where we want to try and concentrate people's attention but they ought to see it as an opportunity to go back and do something yeah. constructive hopefully yeah. in the in the immediate time yeah and 
And you were saying that you're you're um, you know involved in the IPCC process, and we've obviously got a, a bit major report coming out next year. As a, as a scientist, do you feel that um, the negotiators and the chambers, and obviously the politicians back at home, do they listen to these reports anymore? Do they listen to the to, to the scientists? Because you know, from what you've said just now, the the food and security situation with climate change is serious. But um, you know, perhaps what we'll see out of this conference isn't perhaps something that will may, maybe change that, that change the situation on the ground. Yeah, I think something like the IPCC, the very big but of an organised situation, of course, and it has a controversy like all these organised situations. But I think it does generally do a big job in the sheer weight of the number of people that work on these reports. And mm -hmm. they produce a report every five or six years, sort of, yeah, 2007, next one, 2013. Yeah. And, um, and I think when it does come out in 2013, it will be the, you know, that will be the when I think it will, start, it will hopefully reinvigorate the negotiations. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the 2007 one, perhaps did that for the Copenhagen yeah. get together, then that kind of didn't work. Mm. So hopefully next year when our report comes out, <laughs> it will kind of reinvigorate that debate that whole debate really. But a big problem is though, the academic science is still uncertain. Yeah. And I think those uncertainties aren't going to go away mm -hmm. very, very kind of rapidly. So the policy paper can still get wherever they want to the report. And so they, and I here being here this week, you see the misuse of the report all over the place really. Mm. 